Welcome to Great News for the World. In so many ways, the human body is simply marvelous, amply showing the marks of its designer. There is the eye, and how perfect it is in its ability to take light, to be able to interpret that light in conjunction with the brain, to be able to make judgments of distance, to be able to have a an appreciation of color, an appreciation of beauty and design. And we think of the ear and how perfect it is in being able to hear very small and faint sounds, and yet how it's able to hear things that are lovely and appreciate them. And on and on we go in the body until we looked at the way the body as a whole acts. And then we see hate, and we see envy, and we see greed, and we see jealousy. And we wonder, what's wrong? What has happened to this body that's so marvelous? Did God make a mistake? Did he do something that went wrong? Who is to blame for this mess that we find humankind in today? Well, my name is Frank Abel. My guest is Mr. Ron Abel. Together, we'd like to tell you about it. In the Bible, in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 13 to 15, the Bible states, Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Well, that is a very important statement regarding trying to answer this problem. Because God who created us also made this word. God also designed the word so that people who are wondering about this question have a place to go to find the answer. And it shows that there is a process that goes on inside humans which is called man being tempted or drawn away of his own lust. And it says that when a man is drawn away of his lust, he is enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, which is another reason or another word or another description of what the Bible says as disobeying laws of God. And when God finds people disobeying him, the ultimate for that is death, everlasting death. So the Bible does tell us quite a bit about this, but it's important for us to understand exactly how this process works. Well, let's look at it via this little description we have for you. Let's consider, first of all, a test. The Bible speaks of a person having a test as the desire. And people know that there are various things that we have a desire for. It's essential that we desire certain things in order for us to live. But then, Certain things we desire, we make a decision about whether or not we really want that. And so that, the Bible describes as an enticement. So we have the desire, and we move on to the enticement. Now, when people are enticed, then they've made the decision. When they've seen it, they want it, they make the decision. The next thing, of course, is the act. And when people act, and the act in disobedience or contrary to God's law, that's what the Bible calls sin. And of course, the Bible now tells us that the important result of this, the result of that process, is death. So, the Bible spells out for us something that's quite common to life. All of us, I'm sure, have an appreciation of having at one time desired something. And having thought about it, we're enticed to the point, look, I, I just can't leave it alone. One acts, he takes it, and the result, if people are not aware of it yet, the Bible tells us the end result of doing things that are wrong that way is death, everlasting death. Now let's take an everyday example to try to clear this up as much as we possibly can. To make this process the Bible spells out for us really show where the blame is and why it happens. Let's say a person was wandering through a shop and on display in a certain area of the shop he saw something that he'd really wanted for a long time. Now, there's the desire, okay? And looking around, uh, really there's uh, 
nobody watching, there's nobody monitoring the scene, and how easy it would be to just take that and slip it away somewhere and walk out with it. Well, that thought, you see, along with the desire, then produces the enticement, no one's watching, the act. And of course, the act is the disobedience to God's law that we should not do this. The act, it's taken, and one may or may not be caught, but of course, with God, who knows all things, he is aware of what has happened, and if a person manifests that as his way of life, it's quite obvious. The end of that, God spells to be everlasting death. Ron, maybe we can look at something more basic in man as to why this is characteristic of man. Well, Frank, the Bible really puts the source of the problem with the heart of man. The prophet Jeremiah, in his 17th chapter, perhaps summarized this very, very pointedly. He said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So you see, the Bible turns the problem of evil toward the heart of man. The heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all else. Who can know it? Now, Frank, this is just not simply the statement of Jeremiah alone, even though he was, of course, an, an inspired prophet of the Almighty himself. Listen to the words of the Lord Jesus. In the Gospel of Mark, we have recorded there the words of Jesus. And Jesus said, That which cometh out of the man defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Now, friends, when we look at the problem of evil and, and attempt to, uh, to assess the blame here, where do we go? Well, of course, it would be most convenient if we could project the blame for man's problems to some superhuman being like a fallen angel. But, you know, to do so would be only wishful thinking because the Bible says from the heart of man proceed all of these evil things. And therefore, in dealing with the problem of evil, we have to turn the finger toward ourselves. I would like to illustrate, Frank, from the Bible, a good example of how sin takes place. In the book of Joshua, chapter 7, we have recorded the history of the children of Israel in their conquest of the city of Jericho. Now, I know most of you have heard about the city of Jericho. Jericho was the city that the children of Israel marched around until the walls fell down by the power of the Almighty. But there was a specific pronouncement about the taking of this city. The city shall be accursed, even it. They were to take absolutely nothing from the city as a spoil of war, except the silver, the gold, and the vessels of brass and iron, and they would be consecrated and used in the treasury of the Lord. Now, the city did fall, but there was one man in the army of the Israelites called Achan. And this is the account of what took place in Joshua 7.20. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, then I coveted and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. Friends, isn't the process obvious? Did this man Achan require some supernatural being to come to him and say, Achan, look at the Babylonish garment. Look at the wedge of gold. Of course not, friends. The process illustrates what the Bible says about the deceitful nature of the human heart. 
I have sinned, said Achan. I saw, I coveted, I took. And so Achan bore the blame for the sin that he committed. Now friends, in this book, the Bible, we have recorded for us thousands of years of history of the children of Israel. Whole chapters like Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, catalog in detail the sins of the children of Israel. And yet, you know, the Almighty never saw fit to tell the children of Israel that their real problem was some supernatural being. Why this great omission from all of these catalogs of sins and failures of the children of Israel, if perchance the real instigator was some other being than man himself. Friends, we have to face the fact that the Bible puts a responsibility for evil on man. It's out of the heart of man, says Jesus, that proceeds all of these things. Friends, there's nothing else left for any other being to do. Well, Ron, that's interesting because it, uh, it's something like the person who gets, um, say, a, a new motor or something from a shop, and he brings it home, and uh, right away, you know, he wants to get it to work. So he gets out his screwdrivers, and he gets out his pliers, and he goes to work on this motor, and for some reason or other, it won't work. What's he do? He finally goes to read the instructions. Now, that's what we are suggesting is the problem and the solution to it. If there are these things so obviously wrong with men, People don't like envy and lust and hatred and war. Well, there's something wrong. Where do we go? We go to the designer who gave the instructions on how we are to live. Not only does he tell us what we've already mentioned, but I'd like to show you an interesting passage in the first epistle of John, chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Look what he says here about our, our being. He says in verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now there, a little more from our designer. You want to know what's wrong with us? He says, we have three basic lusts. We have the lust of the flesh. Well, you have a desire to eat, you have a desire to drink, you have other desires that come directly from our, our basic being. And of course, some of those things are essential for us to exist, but they can be taken too far, and when they're taken too far, they cut across God's law, and that's sin. Then he says, well, there is the lust of the eye. Well, we see things. We want them because we see them. If we didn't have eyes or couldn't see, we wouldn't see them, and the lust of the eye could hardly work. But having eyes, and we see them, we lust after it. And then, of course, to the other one, the one that brings so much jealousy and hatred, pride of life. Man's pride, to be better, to be equal to his neighbor. I'd like to show you another Bible passage. This one goes back in Genesis chapter 3, and it talks about probably the first real distinct case in the Bible of where we have this thing in action. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. We read the Bible there, that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now there you are. The woman saw the fruit. She desired it because she could see it. She knew the fruit was good to eat. How she knows that, we don't really know, but she knew that it was, it was good for food. And she knew it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. You see, what the New Testament, many centuries later, wrote about mankind was very true in this first act, way back in the book of Genesis, because God is the author of the Bible. He's our designer. He knows what is wrong with us. Well, there's an interesting question to be still asked here, because there was a serpent in the garden, and if we are looking for some to blame, we might just say, but the serpent. 
Ron, how about that serpent? Well, Frank, uh, many people regard the serpent to be something other than the serpent. They think that the serpent was perhaps the, uh, the instigator of the problem, but he was only used as a tool by, say, a fallen angel devil, a very, very popular view in the religious world. Now, friends, in the Genesis account, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the serpent, in Genesis 3 and verse 1, was said to be a creature more crafty or more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. But it was a serpent, and the serpent, Frank, was indispensable in what took place in the trial of man and woman. Now, friends, try if you can to reconstruct the picture of Genesis. God made man and woman. God did not make man and woman perfect. The Bible never says man and woman were made perfect. They were made very good. But it was an untried goodness. They had yet been untested morally as to whether they would be obedient to God in love or whether they would be disobedient. And so the serpent was needful in Genesis to arrest the attention of the woman and indirectly the man to the tree in the garden that God had forbidden them to eat from. Now the serpent, Frank, in the account is indicted for his role in the transgression. And you know, we have a, a prize example here of passing the buck. When God came to the woman um, and to the man and said, you know, why have you sinned? The man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So you see, Frank, the man passed the buck to the woman. And the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman says, well, God, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. So she passes the buck to the serpent. Now, who did the serpent blame? Did the serpent blame some supernatural creature and say, well, God, why are you talking to me? I'm only a helpless serpent. And there's this great fallen angel who's, who's the instigator of all evil, and I'm only a helpless victim. No, friends, in the Genesis account, the serpent is specially endowed with the power of speech. Like Balaam's ass was given the power of speech for the purpose that he had to play in the fall. And the serpent blamed no one because there wasn't anyone else to blame. And if you follow the narrative through, God speaks to the serpent very directly. And he said in verse 14, because thou hast done this thing, thou art cursed above all cattle above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, friends, doesn't it seem grossly um, unjust of God to punish the serpent if he were only the tool of a mighty supernatural devil? Of course it would. God doesn't punish an instant victim when someone else is to blame. Rather, the serpent was a creature, very good like all of the other creatures that the Lord God had made, and who used his reasoning faculty to draw the attention of the woman to the tree. And, says Paul, writing to Timothy, the woman was utterly deceived being in the transgression. Incidentally, friends, that's the reason, one of the reasons why Paul says that a woman ought not to be a public teacher in the assembly of the believers. You can read it for yourself in Paul's epistle to Timothy. And it's based on what took place here, Frank, that was literal history. So the serpent, literal in Genesis chapter 3, becomes a figurative expression of sin elsewhere in the Bible. For example, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus could so powerfully speak to the people of his age, false religious leaders who taught for uh, commandments, the doctrines of men, and he said, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? He addressed the people of his day as serpents. Why? Well, friends, it's the figurative use of what was literal in Genesis chapter 3. 
And similarly, the Apostle Paul, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 11, greatly concerned about the Corinthian believers departing from the one faith, could speak to them in these words, I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Now, friends, the parallel that Paul draws in 1 Corinthians 11 has no force whatsoever unless there was a literal serpent that was subtle and crafty in Genesis chapter 3 and who was instrumental in the deception of Eve. So, Frank, the serpent in the Bible is a symbol of sin. It's found this way in the book of Numbers when Moses erected the pole with the bronze serpent on the pole. Typical of sin. Now, friends, the serpent in Genesis, that was literal and external to man that drew the attention of the woman to the tree, now becomes internal because the serpent out there is the serpent in here. That's the nature that we bear, Frank, this heart that is uh, very, very deceitful and desperately wicked above all else. Well, thank you, Ron, because that uh, leads up into, I think, a very important question we'd like to ask our viewer. Now, as Ron has specified, going through the Bible, the serpent has become a symbol in the Bible. And in particular, one of the passages he alluded to, it was put on a pole in the time of the children of Israel's wanderings in the wilderness. And people who looked on the serpent and knew that the serpent represented their nature and represented a nature that was killing them, so it was lifted up on a stake. Now that was, Moses made a brazen one. He didn't actually lift a, a live one up, but he made a brazen serpent. And the Bible says that the people who looked on that brazen serpent were healed of the bite that they had received. Now I'd like you to consider a chart we have and see if you can determine what is similar. Now this is a, is a reference that Jesus Christ makes, really, to the serpent of the Bible. And we'd like you to consider this in the context of a remark he made in John 3, verses 14 and 15, where he said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. What is Jesus telling us? Here he's comparing himself to a serpent? Yes, he is, because he's telling us that his body that is exactly like our body had the same temptation to sin. And unless that temptation is dealt with in an understanding way so that we can make it dead in our life, then of course there really isn't any possible way for us to attain unto the glorious promises that God's offered. Look at this. The Apostle Paul saw this in the book of Galatians. In chapter 5 of his epistle to the Galatians, we read in verse 24, they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. So if, if people really understand what Jesus was saying, they'll realize that the way to life is to make this desire to sin, this desire that leads to enticement, that leads to the act which leads to eternal death, they've got to make that as much as possible dead in their life. They crucify that when they become a follower of Jesus Christ. So who are we going to blame? Well, it's important to know this. And I think the distinction that sometimes the world makes on this to what the Bible says is something that should be shouted out to the world. Sir, does the book of Revelation state that the devil is a fallen angel? The lady has a question. Doesn't the book of Revelation teach that the devil is a fallen angel? Now, friends, it may surprise you that if you read this book from cover to cover, you will never find recorded in its pages anything about a fallen angel. Now, the book of Revelation does uh, deal with a number of symbols because it was a book that God gave to his servants to show them things which must shortly come to pass. Let me give you an example. 
In Revelation chapter 12, we are introduced to a great red dragon. And this dragon had seven heads and ten horns. And it could drag a third part of the stars of the heavens to the earth. Now, clearly, this is a symbolic dragon. There's no literal red dragon out there that can drag a third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Furthermore, the passage is introduced by a woman who's clothed with the sun, and she has the moon under her feet. If we continue in the book of Revelation in chapter 13, we find there there's a sea beast, and the sea beast has some characteristics of the leopard, of the bear, and of the lion. In fact, the beast of Revelation chapter 13 comes right out of the book of Daniel chapter 7. On the chart here, we have the beast of Revelation 17. This is a scarlet-colored beast. And in chapter 17, we're introduced to a woman who is riding or sitting on this scarlet-colored beast with seven heads and ten horns. Now, friends, in the Bible, you must clearly understand what is literal before moving to what is symbolic. In the scripture, we never read of a fallen angel. And in the book of Revelation, we're introduced to many symbols. The key to the understanding of them is an adequate understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. Well then, who do we blame for man's condition? Where greed and envy and hatred is so manifest in the world around us. We can't blame anybody else, really, can we accept ourselves. The words of Jesus are quite true, that it's out of the heart of men proceed all this wickedness, these unrighteous thoughts, and these unrighteous actions. Well, look, friends, there is great news besides really just identifying that the problem is man's. This problem is going to be removed from the earth because when God's purpose in creating man was that the whole world should be filled with his glory as the waters cover the sea. He's looking forward to a time when human nature will be eradicated from the earth. And as he is offered eternal life, we have the assurance that when we, if we are blessed to be righteous and live on this earth, then we will have a body which no more knows this nature. And this process we've spelt out for you, the desire, the enticement, the act, and the result, which is eternal death, will no longer be a characteristic of men and women. That's great news for the world. Well, read your Bible and see whether or not what we've said is right. And may God bless your study of his word.